It turns out plants can supply all the protein we need. Even if we just ate potatoes, which have the least amount of protein, we could actually survive on it. We get enough protein. So a plant-based diet, and I want to say this, how many of you have been challenged by friends once you've made, a, made the U-turn? How many of you have been asked the question, where do you get your protein from? <laughs> Every hand goes up. <laughs> Just demonstrates a point. That's our, that's our national psyche. That's the way it's been for generations. Very interesting question, the, the whole history of protein, by the way. But in any case, it turns out you don't need to eat animal foods to get the protein, which a lot of people have assumed. In the beginning, most people, and still unfortunately a lot of people today, as you just indicated by your hands, a lot of people today say, well, you need my protein. What they're saying, I need my meat. I need my dairy. I need my eggs. That's what it translates to. And a lot of people really aren't fully aware of this concept. The plants have enough. No problem. And incidentally, it can go up to 20% they showed it without really worrying about it. Things, eat a lot of legumes and beans and so forth and so on. Like that, you get enough, you get quite generous amounts of protein, no problem, because it's enough form of whole food. Another story, though. So anyhow, here's what happens. So we get up to higher levels by consuming animal food. We get the trouble. And here's what happens. When, you know, we, we only consume a certain amount of calories. That's our sort of daily allotment. If we make more of that proportion as animal protein, then what really happens, we're decreasing the consumption of the foods that matter, the plants. So when you talk about a high protein diet, meaning a high animal food diet, two things are going on. One is we're suffering the consequences of the protein itself. And secondly, we're decreasing the stuff that's doing us some good. So, when we talk about a high protein diet, generally meaning a high animal food diet, there's, keep in mind, there's a couple of things going on. The protein itself, through all those mechanisms, and I wish I had time, I could show you lots of stuff that's been ignored for the last hundred years. It's really showing that animal protein is a problem. I mean, for example, put some, let's say subconsciously we said, okay, here you have some more protein, I'm going to get around 16, 17%. And of course, what happens is it subtracts, you know, the a similar amount from plant foods. Uh, now, just to throw this in here, just as an illustration, but there's other charts like this. This is 1975. There's a good friend of mine, Ken Carroll, professor at the University of Western Ontario, and some others had been doing some of these kind of studies comparing populations with respect to how much protein they consume compared to how much disease they get. I think you would find this chart here really interesting because this higher animal protein, higher breast cancer risk, and that line is pretty perfect. Pretty perfect. That was originally published by Dr. Carroll as Dr. Fat. And because it was fat, that's what led to the idea, let's consume low-fat foods. You know, let's consume skim milk. Let's do this, let's do that. The same thing was also published for heart disease. And so this, the other part of this line is, other than the fact that it's really really kind of interesting. It's going, it goes right through the origin, the XY origin. What that says theoretically, no animal food is necessary, not only not necessary, as soon as you start putting animal food in your diet, you're asking for trouble. It's starting to, theoretically at least, sort of increasing the risk of disease. It's true for breast cancer, the same has been sh shown for colon cancer, the same for heart disease, the same for uterine cancer, and in an indirect way, the same for osteoporosis, and so it goes. I'll come back to that. So if you want to keep one take-home message in all of this, it's the one that you'd find <laughs> the most difficult for most people. Don't eat animal food. There's nothing there that we need. I'll come back to that. On that point, when I uh, decided to write the book, I should tell you this, and you know, I'm, I'm, in science, I'm doing stuff. It's all very exciting and so forth. Uh, but I'm coming home and kind of leaning on my wife a bit and complaining about this, that, or something else. One more thing happened. And so um, she told me, she said, why don't you write a book? Sit down and just tell the public. That was the basis of the generation of the China study, by the way. 
Um, and so in doing that book, I did it with my son, who was in theater at the time, good writer, and that's why he started doing it. Now he's a physician, by the way. But in any case, when we were writing the book, 2002 to 2005, that period, I was generally aware that this thing was operating in some other diseases, but we wanted to go back and look a little more formally into the scientific literature to see if this effect of protein existed for any other diseases. And here's what we found. Look at that, all these, some of these are pretty serious and some of them sort of more of a nuisance kind of character. But this, basically we can say this, the whole food, plant-based diet, at least prevents, suspends, that's, that's stopping the growth of it, and or cures these diseases, as illustrated by Dr. Esselstyn this morning. And for example, with heart disease, it reverses it. So all those diseases, I thought, wow, that's a general concept. Now we're to begin to challenge, let's say, the drug industry, who like to operate on one thing for one cure, et cetera. And so there they all are. It led to another, I call it a principle, that's different from what is generally uh, advertised by nutritionists. The whole food, plant-based diet, nutritional effect is broad. Dr. Esselstyn made some reference to some other diseases too. We had this as well. This effect operates on a very broad scale. Fascinating. It's also very rapid. 10 days to two weeks. We do, when I say we, I'm talking about both of my sons actually and some others and Dr. originally Dr. Esselton had done it and many others are doing it. We do the, what we call these uh, jump starts or maybe immersion programs or different names for different things. In other words, take a group of people, just give them the food. Hey, drink, just eat this for 10 days to two weeks or 10 to 20 days. The results we see are so fast. And so it's one of the best selling points of this idea, just let people use the food. Now, the other thing about this diet too is, if it's sustained, and it has to be sustained, we can't use the diet as a, like we do drugs. Okay, we got a one week course of drugs or two weeks or something. Uh, no, it doesn't work that way. This kind of diet, when we start it, and it does some good things, we gotta stay with it. If we go back to the old way, forget it. Everything, all these weeds start growing again. So this has to be a lifestyle, it has to be continuous. Um, and so at least, I'm sorry, you probably can't see that so well. It says whole food, plant-based diet treats illness and disease with no side effects. Fascinating idea. You know, we, you know our grandmothers told us to eat vegetables. And you remember that, your grandmother saying that? I mean, you know, this idea of eating vegetables has been a pretty decent idea for quite a long time. And because you won't get a disease, a disease in the future. That's called preventive medicine. Medical schools have departments of preventive medicine. They've been, quite frankly, kind of useless. They don't do much. So I don't even think about preventive medicine anymore because the better idea, and this is the idea for the future, a whole food, plant-based diet treats illness. Now we're getting into some sacred territory. When people get sick, just change, see what happens. It's a really exciting idea. When you talk about treatment, now it's immediate. Now you see it. So I, I just kind of like that idea there. The majority of these diseases can, in fact, respond in that fashion. So there we have it, whole food, plant-based diet. You know that story. Um, now, one more, one more idea I, I want to get into as well, via, you know, in, in regards to the strength of the evidence. <clears throat> Sometimes people, a lot of people think, oh, uh, I, don't, I don't want to eat that food, I'll just get it in a pill. And so that was an idea that sprung up in, in big, big time in the 1980s. <clears throat> it actually started uh, as a result of a report that I was a co-author to. It was a National Academy of Science report, there were 13 of us. And this is the first report that was actually published by an institution, a major institution, on diet and nutrition cancer. Uh, I was only one of two on that 13-member committee who actually was involved in the research. Um, and we said whole food, a whole food. And that's when a lot of the problems actually started for me when I started saying whole food and plants and, you know, nutrition can do this and that and so forth. But one, one idea, this whole food idea was important. I want to illustrate that as follows. After the... Uh, 1982 report came out and got a lot of attention. It was a most sought after a report in the history of the National Academy of Science at the time. Um, 
we, as I say, we said whole food. And we said, we're not talking about nutrient supplements. This does not apply to nutrient supplements. But the industry had other ideas. They actually took out full page ads and Time and Newsweek, US News and Report. What were the words? Uh, forget the other one. No, yeah, Time. Anyhow, they took out ads talking about this amazing new information that we had developed on the, you know, from this report. What they were talking about is using this information to put them into supplements. So some research started on that. And, you know, we said don't, su this, supplements don't mind, but there was some research that started to check us out on that. So they did a study here on beta carotene. Beta carotene, as you may know, is pre-vitamin -vitamin A and so forth. So what they did, they worked on heavy smokers who get cancer because they're affected by high uh, reactive oxygen you know, in, in from the smoke and so forth. And, and the idea was, okay, all these smokers, they have a high risk of getting lung cancer. Let's give one of them some beta carotene and another's not. There's a joint study between the United States and Finnish scientists, 29,000 male smokers. And they're going to follow them for, you know, up to eight years, see what's going to happen. If beta carotene, which comes from green and leafy vegetables, as you may know, and that there, what we knew at that time, eat green and leafy vegetables, you get less lung cancer. So, okay, take the beta carotene out, put it in, uh, give them this, and that study went on. The food beta carotene decreased lung cancer by a significant 19%. Kind of interesting. And I'll show you more data. It's just, you, you'd be find it hard to believe that you can actually, there's really good research showing that cigarette smokers, if they eat lots of vegetables, they tend not to get lung cancer. That was something that wasn't told very loudly in those days because everybody was interested for good reason to prevent smoking, in a sense. But anyhow, food beta carotene associates with less lung cancer. There you have it, it says it's significant. Supplement beta carotene on the head actually increased lung cancer. So what's going on here? This is ridiculous. Here's a nutrient that's supposed to be the one that actually prevents lung cancer, an antioxidant. Beautiful. When you put it in a pill, it doesn't work. That caused a furor at the time. And there have been a number of studies shown since of this kind of information, really convincing that supplement the nutrients in the form and when it's taken out of the food and put it all by itself, it doesn't work the same way. Vitamin C, here's another little example of that. This is done by a friend of mine at Cornell. Um, here, I'm, I'm talking just for sake of the argument. Uh, he, he took 100 grams of apple. And he measured it and it had 5.7 milligrams of vitamin C in it. Apple's a pretty good source of vitamin C. So it had 5.7 milligrams. And then, so then, and, and what that means is just arbitrarily, 5.7 milligrams of vitamin C gives 5.7 units of good vitamin, good activity in the body. That's, a, that's equivalent. It turns out though, that when you have the whole food form, that 100 grams in the beginning, it has this 5.7 milligrams, you measure it in a whole food form, it says 1,500 units of vitamin C activity. So what you get in the pill is not even close many times. Maybe it has the opposite effect. So the whole supplement industry, the nutrient supplement industry, which is now standing at around 30 some billion dollars a year, 50% of the people using nutrient supplements, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it really, for the most part, doesn't work. It can have the opposite effect. I was actually asked, since this came from our report, 1982 report, where we said don't use supplements. And so they started, and that what challenged the National Academy of Science decided to challenge the entire industry <clears throat> in the uh, Federal Trade Commission hearings in Washington because they were making claims that were false. They were false. And they asked, I was the principal witness, they asked me to represent them over a three year uh, sort of uh, trial, uh, being in the docket, sort of reviewing the claims they were making to see if they're true. So I, I followed it fairly closely over the years, and now we know they don't really work. This is not the message we're talking about here. It just is not. Um, okay, so now, see, one of the things I, I liked about nutrition is that instead of talking about one thing at a time, it's not a single mechanism. It's not a single nutrient, I can assure you. 
In fact, so-called nutrients are far more than 40 or 50 nutrients and probably not the thousands of different kind of chem chemicals that have nutrient activity. And, and does it apply to humans and all this? Here's some questions that came up for me at the time. First off is casein, which we were using, is it representative of animal protein in general? I'm going to say yes, just answer these. Animal protein, is it representative of animal foods? It, you know, when you're eating animal foods, it's not only protein, you're changing these other things I already said. Is it too much animal foods, too little plant foods? Which is it? Well, we can't measure it exactly, but basically they're both at work. And the question is whether it applies to humans. This is the kind of thinking that I thought was important to consider at the time we had an opportunity to go to China to look at a big population of people. Uh, and in China, in the 70s, they had published a maps, these color-coded maps, of how much cancer occurred for 13 different, 13, 12 or 13 different cancers, how much cancer occurred in all those different counties. And it was a color-coded business like this. So the first senior scientist from China to come to the United States, Dr. Chen Zhishui, came to my laboratory. Uh, and we got, went back to China and organized a, a big research project between the United States and China. It involved 6,500 families and 130 villages and so forth and so on. And what we wanted to do was to find out if we could learn something about the role of nutrition in causing diseases to be so high in those different places. And so, and this had already had been noted before to some extent, that was the original China study, China project. It's actually 896 pages. It's a big thing like that, like an atlas, just loaded with all kinds of information that we collected from blood samples and urine samples and fruits. And I just want to show you just one little piece of evidence from that study. We had access to death rates for those different diseases. And what I learned, just looking at them, all those diseases, either in the one, diseases on the left or on the right, they're all correlated with these diseases in the same group. So here's a group of diseases that I thought was really significant. It's over here, the cancers, diabetes, coronary heart disease. They tend to go together. They tend to be in the same location. They tend to be in the same communities and so forth and so on. So then the question was, what is mostly related to these Western diseases? It's blood cholesterol. Cholesterol was an indication. Cholesterol doesn't cause these diseases. It's an indication. And so what we found was, as cholesterol levels in China were only 127 milligrams, in this country, like 210. So as we saw cholesterol start to go up in the blood from very low levels, that's when we started seeing these diseases occur. Um, I hope I didn't make that too confusing, but these Western diseases, uh, mostly in the, from our data, was highly correlated with the amount of cholesterol in the blood, even though it was generally low. I'll, I'll return to that in, in a moment, a little bit later. So here's the words to match what I'm sort of showing here. A whole food plant-based diet with little or no added fat, sugar, and salt solves more illnesses than all the pills and procedures combined. I think that's a pretty remarkable concept because we're living on pills as a means of uh, sort of going forward. And the nutrition itself can do far better. So I call this effect of nutrition, not on the basis of one nutrient, which you know, we get such arguments all the time about how much of this nutrient, how much of that. And it's silly arguments, I, sh I must say, uh, not terribly meaningful. Uh, and uh, the, the effect of nutrition, the really remarkable effects of nutrition is the whole food. So I'm looking at it this way. Multiple nutrients, multiple mechanisms, multiple diseases, all of that. I call it holism with a W. It's a whole thing kind of working together. It's just truly a remarkable thing. Whole food plant based diet. And I, I just sort of summarize it by saying this is a highly interactive, integrated, holistic system without making protein a cult. That's what we've lived with, we've lived with now for more than a century. We don't need that protein from animal foods. It causes all kinds of mischief. If we just do it that way, we get the results. Mm -hmm.